Okay, first of all, the final schedule for tomorrow, um, dealing with the cancellations, is first talk will be Zohar, we'll continue his lectures. So, okay, he's agreed to give the first talk. Nadi will give the second talk. As the original schedule was, Ahmed will give the third talk. And the fourth talk will be an encore presentation from our speaker today, our last speaker today, Nikita Nekraso, who is going to give a survey of physical mathematics, or mathematical physics, or physics and Mathematics math for physically challenged. <laughs> <laughs> Nikita. OK, um, so uh, it's a great pleasure to be back in this room. Um, the first time I was in this building was 25 years ago. Uh, and I remember this, so the schools, the Jerusalem winter schools, when you arrive, if you, especially if you come from the United States, which was the case 25 years ago, and you are so jet lagged. So the first five lectures, you sleep. And then it's the last lecture of the day when you kind of finally wake up and can learn something. So thank you, David, for scheduling me. But Zohar wakes up. What? The speaker. The speaker wakes up. <laughs> so, but uh, Zohar did a very good job. Everybody was awake already. So, I, I'm, uh, so the second thing I should say is that uh, so this year was the anniversary of my uh, of Zohar predecessor, in a sense, my former colleague at the Simon Center, Mike Douglas, and I was organizing conference in his honor, and I invited uh, one of uh, you know, Mike's uh, uh, famous collaborators, and also my collaborators, Greg Moore, to participate, and Greg said, okay, I will participate, but on one condition, that we will write a snow mass paper together. So snow mass for, I mean, I don't really know what snow mass is, but it's a, I know it's a, it's a city, or town, and there is a so the movement in, in, theoretical f in, in the actual experimental physics community and the theoretical physics community where people try to summarize what has been done and what, what's, what's, what's going to be done. And so people write reviews of the subjects. And so Greg was um, given the task of reviewing uh, something on the interface of physics and mathematics, which he likes to call physical mathematics. And, uh, and so he dragged me into this. And I, I agreed. Uh, and then, um, so actually we, were, we had um, several collaborators, which was very fortunate because they were young and bright and, and active. So it was Ibo. <laughs> but uh, uh, Dan Fried, the youngest <coughs> and the most active, um, Shlomo Razamat. Sakura Shafian Nameti, and of course Greg Moon. And so we had a great time uh, you know, writing this review that it took maybe a few months. And then the result was four pages, which you post, post on, on archive, which contained nothing. Maybe you just you know, first lines of, 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 of a paragraph, a few paragraphs. So then we worked a few mo months more, and then we decided to post a more comprehensive uh, review. And it was like 500 pages long already. Well, if you know Greg Moore, it will not surprise you. But uh, 300 pages were just references. <laughs> <laughs> but then my collaborators decided it was too long. And so the chapter which I wrote was kicked out. And so now it's uh, 30 pages long and 300 <coughs> pages, uh, references. And so I'll give the lecture tomorrow, which will try to review what, <laughs> what I, I didn't write in this review. OK, so now the serious stuff. So what is physical mathematics is uh, uh, <coughs> it's the um, I mean, it's a, it's a great question what it is and how to define it. And, and I, I believe people have, have not thought about this seriously. Because I think it should be a, 
it's, it's a scientific question, actually. Uh, there, there is a science called epistemology, which I, uh, I the, the first time I heard this word was from Yuval Niemann. Unfortunately, he had an accident and passed away uh, soon after that. So um, I know some you know, people at certain stage of their career get interested in, in these things. And, and, you know, how we learn things, what, what does it mean to know, what does it mean to define, and uh, so I believe there is a way to you know, say what, how theses think and how mathematicians think. And so what happens when you combine this, uh, these two things? Uh, so I don't, I mean, every, every, any way you try to, to position the words mathematical physics, physical mathematics, it's, uh, it, it gets um, bad because uh, some people get offended. So when you say that, well, this is mathematical physics, then physicists usually say, well, it's, it's too mathematical, or mathematicians say it's too physical. So you're being kicked from both sides if you, if you work on the interface. And, um, but some people, and I think I belong to this group of people, we feel that uh, that's <coughs> what we want to do, <laughs> even though we don't know how to define it. And uh, so it's, it's thinking about certain questions which obviously have bearing both in theoretical physics and in, in mathematics. And if you do it right, I think you'll push both fields, actually. It, you, it, it helps both fields. Uh, uh, to develop. If you don't do it right, then you just get something boring out of it. Right? And uh, I will not name names, but they were mentioned in the previous Why lecture. Why can't we have called it? Um, what do we call geometry? <laughs> so, uh, you know, it's actually, that's a good example. So geometry originally, as, as the name suggests, is, was supposed to be a skill of measuring, you know, land, land measuring land, like prospecting, right? And look what it became. So, uh, okay, I would, I would prefer much more prefer the the, the, the name. Right. But uh, people make fun of philosophers now all, all the time. So, so it's kind of uh, also demeaning for everybody. I mean, I should, I, I should think philosophy should also be a part of it, but uh, anyway. anyway. If you look at where, where we work and what we do, you will understand that what, what this whole topic is really about is trying to understand what is quantum field theory. And uh, well, in the previous, so Zohar explained to you that quantum field theory, for example, could be a continuous limit on a spin chain. Uh, but actually, if you talk to Zohar as much as I do, you know that you know the other day he will tell you that why do people even start thinking about you know discrete systems, larger systems? Why 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 bother? So it is not always a system. It is not always a, a limit of a spin chain, and we know many interesting examples where we have no idea how to define what we believe is a quantum field theory, how to define it in lattice, or how to define it using any other approaches which I will review. But, uh, so I will review what we, what we know, and uh, I'll try to review what we don't know. So, um, <coughs> but you know, when mathematicians try to understand what quantum field theory is, they say, OK, this is something that's very far from us, but we we'll, let's first try to understand kind of a reduced version of, of <coughs> what this could be. And that would be, I will call them models. So models with less degrees of freedom. <coughs> and those, this could be topological field theories, which are almost, but not quite, as understandable as quantum mechanics. So mathematicians understand what quantum mechanics is. So that's uh, 
text to von Neumann and, and others. So there is a mathematical definition of quantum, what quantum mechanics is. Although, I should also say that many physicists at certain stage of their career start saying that we don't know what quantum mechanics is. You have to revise foundations and uh, think about the... Um, and then people split. Some people say we should think about what the measurement is, and other people say we should think about what the event is. And, um, and I, I say we should think about what is. is. <laughs> These are not unrelated questions. <laughs> anyway, but okay, so something which people have a lot of fun with is called topology computer theory. And there is a kind of a upgrade of that which is less complicated than generic quantum field theory, but slightly more complicated than topological field theory is, let me call it roughly, holomorphic field theory. Sometimes <coughs> some people say it's a generalization, some people say it's a subset. So if, if the normal rules of set theory, which I believe some people in the next building are studying, apply, that means that it's the same thing. So uh, string theory. Nikita, you don't think that in this chain integrable string theory? Thank you. So, you see, these things generalize to conformal field theories, which in some sense in some sense, all of quantum <coughs> field theory sh lives under the umbrella of conformal field theory, but in, in some other sense, this is also a subset of, of all quantum field theories. And uh, some of the conformal field theories, especially those which admit holomorphic realization, Admit deformation to the integral field theories. Um, uh, now, string theory. So, in some respects, like if you just you know, think of it perturbatively, looks like a generalization of quantum field theory. You are trying to violate the uh, complementarity principle. <laughs> for many, many years, we had, uh, we had the rule that uh, either one of us is late for the, uh, is so late for the others, for the, for the talk of the other person that it just makes no sense to come. <laughs> Usually I was a guilty party. <laughs> I'm Nikita. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so uh, if you think about string theory perturbatively, so this this is a, a kind of a generalization of time and diverse <coughs> quantum field theory. Where sums over over Fermi graphs are replaced by uh, sums over string diagrams, which, which uh, from far apart, from from far away look <coughs> look like some climate diagrams, uh, and so in that sense it's a generalization. On the other hand, uh, you can actually represent the the uh, computation of string string amplitudes by uh, by cutting the modular space of even surfaces <coughs> into in pieces in, in a certain ingenious way. You can actually represent these uh, 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 string diagrams as sums or Feynman diagrams in some uh, version of, of field theory, which which is called string field theory, and so in that sense, uh, it's just a so string theory, just a particular case of quantum field theory, uh, perturbatively. Um, now, in so this was the statement of maybe thirty years ago. Years ago, uh, for the last twenty or so years, we have other reasons to believe that uh, 
even non perturbance of the string theory <coughs> is equivalent to quantum field theory, and that goes under the name of holography and AD CFT, CFT correspondence. Will you go back to topology? Or yes, yes, I'm just listing the topics. Okay, so you will discuss in detail the topology. To the extent it's possible to discuss uh, anything in detail here, I'll try to do Topological field theory. Yes. By topolo yes. So because topology <coughs> has many... Topological field theory. Okay. You okay. yeah. can add a Q. Q? Quantum topological field. Well, this is quantum. Yes, it's, it is quantum. <coughs> so, uh, and so because of idea CFT, we know there are at least there are examples where we believe is complete equivalence of non perturbative string theory and quantum field theory, and so it might be the same thing after all. Now, the thing which we don't know what it is, but we have uh, some examples of of uh, calculations may, there. May, may I make a comment? Yes. Sir? So, uh, I mean, yes, through holography, you might say that string theory is like well. All you have is the CFT, so it's a quantum field theory. But there's another ingredient, which is the dictionary. There's an additional uh, uh, set of rules that you need to figure out. Independent, at least it seems to me that it's independent of the CFT. You can you can completely solve the CFT uh, the theory on the CFT side, learn everything there is to know about it, all correlation functions, etc. But there's still there's still another step, which seems to be is naively outside of the realm of what, of what quantum field theory is, a new set of rules that gives you the dictionary to reconstruct the, the string theory in the book. Uh, well, but that's okay. So uh, if I understand the question correctly, is that uh, it's just a question of, I mean, what when we say that we know what quantum field theory, we should really uh, think about what does it mean to, to, to what are this full set of relational functions, what are the full set of operators observ and observables which we <coughs> Uh, which we should uh, understand. And so I'll try to talk about this. And, and this is, uh, you know, the example of topological field theories is, is one example when we get uh, relatively recently uh, get the uh, kind of new insights into this question. So what, what uh, people thought about local quantum field theory many years ago seems to be, no, seems to be not sufficient to even for quantum field theory purposes, and presumably uh, not sufficient for establishing influences to things like string theory. Um, okay. So <coughs> we know that <coughs> for certain versions of string theory, in some backgrounds, the uh, certain limits, like, like strong coupled limit of type 2 string theory, has an emergent 11 dimensional. Uh, symmetry, and uh, suggesting that there is a there is a uh, there is a valid theory <coughs> which uh, we don't have a microscopic uh, microscopic definition of, in the sense that we have some kind of microscopic <coughs> definition of string theory, but we have a good deal of uh, indirect knowledge about about it. Uh, we know that its low energy description is uh, eleven dimensional supergravity. We know what kind of extended objects it has, and we have many, many ways of uh, checking that uh, various compactifications of, of this uh, unknown object uh, reduced to known theories. And the fact that these reductions are compatible is a kind of a check that this object exists. So, so, so it's like we have an elephant. We don't know what an elephant is, but we know its trunk, we know its tail, we know its ears. And so the question is, what's the common denominator? That has not been achieved. And uh, uh, so what can, can be said about this uh, in the realm of, of uh, physical mathematics is that there are certain trun truncations <coughs> similar to the truncations of quantum field theory leading to topological field theory or holomorphic field theory, which, apply, which can be applied to M theory to the best of our knowledge. And those truncations. Uh, actually fall into the class of uh, hybrid models which are topological and holomorphic. So topological in some directions, holomorphic in other directions. And uh, what's non-trivial is that this is consistent 
in the sense that you can split these topological and holomorphic directions in different ways and get compatible results. Um, okay. So another topic which uh, which we reviewed there was the and that's a kind of a time honored topic where mathematicians have contributed a lot is the topic of anomalies. And so these are anomalies in, in field theories, anomalies in, in string theory, and uh, and uh, uh, the recent interest in uh, theories with generalized symmetries, and so I will, I will say a few words about the so <coughs> anomalies and there are symmetries. And there are generalized symmetries. And generalized, so th there are different people mean different things when they talk about generalized symmetries. So there, there are uh, symmetries generalized in the sense that the uh, corresponding uh, gauge potentials are higher forms. So they are called sometimes higher form symmetries, which can be, which can coexist <laughs> with conventional symmetries, which we couple to ordinary gauge fields or vector potentials. Uh, there are generalized symmetries in the sense of of systems with constraints. So if you think about the uh, BV formalism, so this is the case when Batalin Dukariski goes beyond your T. And these are actually not as exotic as you might think. Typically, if you think about the, the way symmetry is, is, is realized in the effective theory, so you might start with the ultraviolet theory, which has a conventional symmetry, which is generated by the Lie algebra. You can couple, uh, uh, you can couple the system to a background gauge field. You can do it in a now fully uh, fully BRST way. So you can introduce not only the vector potential, you can also introduce ghosts and anti-ghosts. And so they will be will serve as background fields which will couple to uh, various currents and fermionic currents. Uh, even for the bosonic theory, even for young Mills theory. And uh, so that will modify the action, the original. So if you start, let's say, I had some action which had some, which was a function of fields, let me call it A, and it was inver invariant under some symmetries. This could be global symmetries or, or gauge symmetries. And um, so then I can promote to the to the action which will uh, so, this, I'm, I'm, so I'm using the, uh, the BV formalism where you have so-called fields and anti fields. Maybe I will review it in, in detail later but just for the, to, to write some kind of formula. So, uh, so these are original, this is original action, and it, it is invariant under some transformations. So then you can promote it to the action depending on, on ghosts and anti-ghosts, um, roughly this form. So these are the infinitesimal transformations of your fields. Which, uh, so my fields have some label mu. Mu could be both the tangent index, could be some is that, uh, some internal index, could be also a point in space time. So this is very, very generic uh, annotation. And I have some parameters, epsilon, which generate my symmetry, which is in general dependent. So you can uh, add to this, uh, this term which uh, generates the, this transformation and then uh, we know that we supplement it with the you know, BRST term. And so this new action 
has this nice feature that it solves the so-called master equation. Let me just leave it at this point that this, this is some equation which which uh, which is important. <laughs> and uh, now imagine that you integrated out some of the fields. So that would so so th this action is linear in the in the anti field in the, in the sometimes it's called the B ghost. Uh, so so this linearity is responsible for for the fact that uh, these transformations V close to the V algebra. So that uh, so this is quadratic and ghost, and that's why the, uh, this equation is equivalent to the state saying that that the transformations obey the uh, V algebra relations. But once you integrate out some of the fields. But without integrating out the ghosts and super ghosts, uh, and that the ghost, the action becomes non becomes <coughs> nonlinear in those ghosts. And so that symmetry somehow is uh, is became uh, a higher form symmetry. It's, it's a higher symmetry. It's not a higher form symmetry. So this is. So, uh, so this is higher form symmetry, it's, uh, and this is higher symmetry. These uh, are <coughs> different technical terms, but um, I believe there is some relation between, between these uh, subjects. So, both types of symmetries can be anomalous. So, the anomaly in this formalism is reflected in the, in the impossibility. So, you what the equation which you really want to solve is the so-called quantum master equation. Um, and so you can try to, uh, so once you start perturbing the theory, and this perturbation can be uh, both the result of you physically modifying the theory, <coughs> or it could be the result of, again, integrating out some fields. And, and so, uh, so you can try to solve this equation by, by, uh, by iterations, and uh, it may happen that at some stage, so you start with something which, uh, which are based classical, uh, classical, classical master equation. Then you, you, you want to try uh, find the quantum correction, and so that will be some linear equation on this S one. <coughs> this equation may not be re resolvable, and so this is how the anomalies uh, are visible at the level of of, of this formalism. Uh, <coughs> But of course, we have other other ways of of uh, <coughs> thinking about those. Question: I mean, so, so generically, I mean, uh, once you introduce this ghost, that's not end of the story because it can still be local invariant. Uh, other invariant or something that we introduce second uh, generation of ghosts and so on, ghost for ghost. And, uh, so 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 system. so the point the point is that sometimes this. Uh, uh, nonlinear, never-ending sequences of, of corrections are the result of of uh, not, not not thinking about the more microscopic divisor freedom. So 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 it might be that you have a more fundamental formulation of the theory <coughs> for which the symmetry was realized in an ordinary way, but the theory which you are looking at is already the defective theory. And what happens with string theory actually is that it is always the defective theory in that sense because. Uh, because the, so this way of decomposing remote modules to the surfaces it has a parameter for for experts. So you, there is some you, you to do some measure on on remote surfaces, uh, which tells you how far they are from 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 graphs, and this measure can be made uh, more rough, but it can be made finer. So you can go one way, but you can not go the other way. And so in string field theory, we always deal with those uh, higher symmetries actually. But, uh, uh, in some examples of topological string, which which will be my number five problem on the list, <coughs> you, you know that. Uh, there are some hints that maybe we can get at some, at some point to the fundamental degrees of freedom. So for topological strings, maybe it is possible to actually guess what is the fundamental object, s such that after integrating some part of this fundamental degrees of freedom out, we'll get string theory as it is. <coughs> but this has not been completely done. Um, it always looks like there are some kind of open strings which are more fundamental than closed strings. And so they they work on that. It's, uh, uh, but um, it's not uh, 
it was a done deal. <laughs> um, okay, so uh, since I did not violate complementarity uh, principles, so I, I, I didn't attend uh, Matty's lecture, I don't know what he talked about, but I imagine that he would cover anomalies in a, in a much more profound way than I, than I could possibly do. Okay. <laughs> so my guess is right. Um, so the topic which has some interesting uh, uh, connections to Poincaré and, and others is the is called geometrization of, of quantum field theory, and, and so that is an attempt to try to encode the uh, interesting qualities of interest uh, for quantum field theories in some geometric information. So the prototype of that idea, of course, is, is kaluza klein theory, when you try to uh, parameterize a class of Lagrangians by uh, starting with some unique theory in uh, higher dimensions, like Einstein theory, some uh, unknown value of one constant and compactify it on, on some way. So that gives you a way to parameterize the gauge couplings, uh, scalar couplings, uh, and uh, Newton's constant in terms of the geometry of the central manifold. Uh, as is, well, in the pure gravity theory, this program was not very successful, first of all, because we don't know how, for, mostly because we don't know how to quantize gravity. And, and, and these scenarios are typically unstable without supersymmetry. But <coughs> in the context of string theory, this has been uh, quite successful in the, in, the, in the sense that certain classification program, <coughs> pro problems, uh, especially in the supersymmetric context, can be done um, in, in geometric terms. And so there are roughly three classes of, of, of ideas. Uh, they are not independent, and they, there are overlaps between them. So so one is so-called geometric engineering. And so that's the idea that, uh, so we start with string theory or M theory in 10 or 11 dimensions on, uh, on the manifold. Of, again, it starts like, looks like a line. So suppose I'm interested in four dimensional theories. But this manifold X is not compact. So it's not like a logic line. Uh, but it has some features. So it has some non-trivial cycles. And uh, presumably, uh, the, the, the main idea is that if you look at the, at the modes of supergravity uh, uh, and string theory, there are some trap modes which are localized in the finite part, finite part of X. For example, uh, an example of, of, of this construction is that uh, uh, it's a kaluza klein monopole, where, which is, uh, was this the story when you, you had a famous uh, uh, footnote uh, saying that you, 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 you're aware of, of the fact that you contradict Einstein? Right? Yes. So it's an example of, of a smooth solution. The editors. Said, great paper, but you should remove the footnote. It's disrespectful of us. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we know that uh, drag monopole is a singular solution of Maxwell equations, has infinite energy, uh, and so it should not be considered as part of uh, uh, Maxwell theory. But uh, if you add additional degrees of freedom, which can be activated close to the uh, monopole core, you can make it more singular. So one example is to uh, embed U1 theory into a C2 theory. So that would be the uh, two polycore monopole. And another example is, it is to embed Maxwell theory in, in, uh, into Einstein theory in higher dimensions. And so that would be the close klein monopole. So, uh, but from the gravity point of view, that means that you take as a space X, uh, maybe in this case, X would be 
the top is called top dot space cross I guess it's also known as cross grain monopole. And so it's a non-compact space. In fact, it's diffeomorphic to R4, but not metrically. And what's what's interesting about the metric on that space is that it supports L2 normalizable. Harmonic two form. <coughs> so it means that there is a solution of uh, of equations um, on on that on that space now on this space which I denote by T n. Uh, so it's a two form which is closed and co-closed, and moreover, its integral is finite. And that means that if your theory you start with in, um, let's say, 11 dimensions, so it's 4 plus 3 plus 4, uh, has, a, has a three form as a dynamical field. And the 11 dimensional super supergravity is such a theory. It has a three form as a dynamical field. Then this two form will produce by Kaluzic line ansatz uh, a gauge field. So this leaves <coughs> and so and so this so this gauge field is trapped to, 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 to live somewhere in seven dimensions. So the seven dimensions are somewhere somehow embedded into the eleven dimensional space. You can't really say where the seven dimensions are, but uh, so if you uh, so there is some scale in, the, in, in, the, in the metric, defining the metric of this of the, of the space. So you can say that it's somewhere within this that scale from the center, so where this monopole monopole is sitting. And so that's a very rough st starting point from which you can generate many more non-trivial examples. So you can take as x Calabi uh, manifolds, and uh, so you can start with a compact Calabi threefold, which would by usual Kaluzic line logic uh, uh, give rise to a, uh, not only field theory in, in foreign matches, but also gravity. So it will be a, a whole mess. Uh, but now if you take a limit when this calabi manifold becomes non-compact, has infinite volume, then the four-dimensional gravity will be non-dynamical. And so you will decouple four-dimensional degrees of freedom from the rest, which will still live in, in 11 or 10 dimensions. And so that's a way to generate lots of interesting examples of quantum field theories. And if this X is a manifold of reduced holonomy, so if it has the covariantly constant spinner, uh, then uh, the resulting QFT will be supersymmetric. And then uh, it means that certain questions about this QFT will be kind of robust. It will not de de depend on fine details, for example, on, on the Full, so the full knowledge of the metric of the space, which is never, almost never accessible, will not be needed. And you may be able to say something about the, the low energy physics of that quantum field theory from whatever information about the geometry of X you have. So that's one, one idea. So in this presentation, it looks like a vague idea because where these trapped mode, modes are on X is kind of fuzzy, but there is a kind of a dual point of view where you just say that you just say take a punch of d brains, which are embedded in, in let's say, different maybe geometry. And so here, the <coughs> physics, the low energy physics of, of open strings which under those d brains will be manifestly lower dimensional. And so it will leave in the, if, if the, let's say, d3 brains, which are uh, span the four dimensional Minkowski space and look like points on Y, then clearly we have some four dimensional theory. Uh, so, uh, in some cases, there are, there are string dualities which relate one picture to another. So, so you, can, you can map certain purely geometric constructions to the constructions with D-brains and vice versa. And um, the last construction, which is also related and which I mentioned, <coughs> is, is the dimensional uh, 
reduction, except that here, uh, what's the non-trivial is that the manifold on which you reduce So I, if I, st I start with the quantum field theory in, in capital D dimensions, I put it on the manifold which may have corners. And so that's where things become really interesting. <coughs> so not just so it's not just <coughs> um, the usual story of again. Line when you just uh, do the Fourier decomposition of the modes of whatever fields you have in, in, in terms of this in the spectrum of Laplacian of uh, on this compact manifold X, uh, uh, the previous two exa examples suggest uh, that um, it makes sense to consider more general classes of internal manifolds than previously were studied. So. Manifolds with, with corners, things like that, with, with boundary conditions which might change. Uh, are quite quite interesting and lead to many interesting examples. And some of them again are due to so some of these constructions are due to, to the more uh, conventional ones. Okay, um, so a big class of problems which uh, I would say they are sound more like interesting questions than, than uh, I know of real purpose there, but, but, I, but nevertheless, uh, so it's an example of problems coming from physics which inspire questions which mathematicians find amusing and uh, they ask themselves why didn't they think of this before? And so these are the questions which are, which come from the uh, swampland community. Nikita, can I ask you before that? Yes. You were, so when topological field theory came out, yes. uh, one of the physics motivations was that maybe it's one phase of a theory and the other phase would be the gravity, gravity. which we deal with. And I wonder, what is this project dead or is there is there, are there no goals on this project, or where is it? No, well, I, I'm um, uh, very, very much interested in, in this project today, to this day. So, so, uh, so <coughs> to me, it's not that. Um, I will probably say something new about this. So, hopefully, so there is something new which came from thinking about these things. Uh, so, I, I apologize. I, I started saying something about the lines of a plan instead of just listing the plan. But I, I was afraid that if I just you know, spend the first 40 <coughs> minutes of listing, listing the topics, people will just fall asleep despite the fact that it's time to wake up. Uh, not everybody came from the United States. So, so I, I, will, I will say, I will talk about topological, clomorphic, and, and hybrid. This was the part when my collaborators kicked me out from, from <laughs> <laughs> Okay, let me just say that uh, quantum gravity inspired constraints on quantum field theory and by the previous relation to certain geometries, so questions geometry of um, let me be very generic, so ge uh, questions about the geometry of Calabian manifolds and the modular spaces. So Calabiaus are a, a, a way to keep track of a certain class of <coughs> quantum field theories. And uh, if you assume some, if you uh, 
uh, assume, make some conjectures, assume some kind of validity of conjectures, like the weak gravity conjecture, for example. That in every compatibilization of string theory, uh, the gravity is the weakest force. That leads to some kind of predictions about the, the geometry of the uh, corners of the moduli spaces of, of the calabials, so when the calabials degenerate, become very large, and also uh, predictions about the, the uh, modular spaces as a whole. So that, uh, for example, the, the conjectures about the kind of the statistics of string theory vacua at least implies that, that <coughs> the volume of these non-compact spaces uh, by Peterson volume form should be finite. And that's that's highly non-trivial. So the simplest Calabial manifold is the elliptic curve. And its modular space is this uh, it's, it's not it's actually it's non-compact region in the upper half plane. So this is Calabial one in the usual nomenclature, so the modular space of Columbia once is the uh, it's a quotient of the upper half plane by the action of the group SL to Z. So these are the transformations of the modular parameter. And so this space, uh, so the space is obtained as, uh, should I say a few words about what this space is? So this is the upper half plane, this is where the, the uh, so you can represent this torus as the quotient of the um, the two-dimensional plane by a lattice, which is in, in complex notations is generated by one and tau. And so there are different uh, taus which can lead to isomorphic uh, isomorphic tori. Uh, so this is a caricature. So the actual modular space of Calabio ones uh, contains two copies of, of this structure, but let's skip that. So there is a metric of that space which is invariant under the SL to Z transformations. So tau has imaginary, imaginary <coughs> part. So this is the line minus one half plus one half. <coughs> this is I. This is the cube root of one. And, and so this it goes off to infinity, so it's not compact. So if you, for example, if you try to measure the length of the geodesic, which goes from from the uh, square torus to the extremely degenerate one, so if you try to squeeze it, that's infinite. So the length is infinite. But the volume is finite. So if you integrate, this is. Uh, In fact, it has to do with the zeta function. And this is where number theorists get excited, and uh, I, will, I will not talk about number theory, even though it has many <coughs> connections to also to, to questions about black holes, for example. Uh, I will also not talk about condensed matter physics, again, because not is here. So, in, in, uh, so that's a huge source of uh, questions of deep mathematical significance, which, for some reason, was uh, realized o only recently, like ten years ago. So, so, so the questions that uh, algebraic topologists were, were working on for for many years, and, but some questions they didn't even think about again, and, and that they arise arose in, uh, in, for example, in Kitai's pro program of classification of of, uh, of phases. Um. So, uh, sorry. Yes. Is, is it proven that the volume of the modular space of every calamita is finite? No, it's not proven. So that's a conjecture, but it, it, it has been checked in, in many non trivial ca cases. And so it apparently it's a non trivial conjecture. So, uh, and, uh, and as far as I know, there is no counter counterexample. So it's a. Uh, it's not, of course, it's not a proof that you know the swamp land conjectures are true, but the fact that 
they lead to something which seems to be non-trivial and, and, and true, well, it's uh, something you have to deal with. OK. Uh, so, so I leave this to, to Nazi, condensed measure and, and number theory. So <laughs> there are other topics like geometry and topology outside this, this domain. I mean, this is a huge part of mathematics, and, and uh, it has lots of connections to, to uh, quantum field theory questions through geometrization program, through anomalies, through, uh, uh, and also through supersymmetry. So, uh, okay. So, there <laughs> so I mentioned I mentioned higher symmetries, and there are more mathematically there are mathematically more sophisticated structures called operats, uh, BV algebras. And they, they connect to back to topological string theory understood now as a study of operations. So study so very uh, abstractly if you think about now, quantum field theory in a kind of a so if modern way. Um, so imagine that you have a theory which is defined in the, in the, in, the, uh, in Euclidean space. So let's talk about it. So imagine if we work in Euclidean, and I compute the path integral path integral over the space of fields on the on the disk. So this is some. D-dimensional QFT and have a D-dimensional disk. Uh, well, it's it's a state, so we believe there is a there is a sp <coughs> space of states associated with the boundary of this disk. But now imagine that I started removing smaller round balls from the interior. So the balls could be, so they have some positions, they have some, some radii. Well, this is a structure which can be uh, superimposed. So ge just geometrically, this, the, the ball with certain number of balls removed, if I have two such things, I can scale, I can scale the second ball so that it will match precisely one of the balls in here. And uh, and if I, I can do it for, for each of for, 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 for each of the holes here, and so that way I can uh, I'm, I'm defining a composition of a high operation. So so this path integral I can view as the, as the map. From uh, let me number them one, two, three, four. So it's a map from the uh, tensor product of four copies of the space of states into itself. So this let me call this uh, phi one. So this is phi one and. This other guy is phi, phi two. It's the map from um, from the tensor product of three copies of the Hilbert space. Into H three, and so 
just gluing in, this, in the sense of geometries defines in the composition. And so that will be uh, map from H5, H6. H7, H1, H2, H4, into H. So you can represent it as a diagram. <coughs> you have, a, you have a, um, an operation, 3 goes to 1. <coughs> this is phi 2, which is being composed with an operation 4 goes to 1, which was phi 1. And so by studying all, you know, possible ways of, of gluing, moving, decomposing, you get very all kinds of relations between these operations. And so this is, uh, so the totality of these operations is an example of the high algebra, also called, as, known as the algebra over the little disk opera. So this is, this structure is called the little So this is a structure which is actually present in every quantum field theory. <coughs> uh, but there are actually more structures, because if, if you imagine studying quantum field theory in a space with a boundary, then uh, sometimes these disks will be cut by a boundary. So then you need to consider things which have both holes and half holes, and you can compose them in different ways, and so this is this is a different type of operator. It's called the Swiss cheese operator. And so there is some progress which is obtained by thinking about you know what does this geometry uh, of these compositions translate to at the level of correlation functions of quantum field theory. It's uh, I mean, I wouldn't say it's an enormous progress, but it's at least it gave something non-trivial. One example of, of a structure which led to the, uh, from, from these considerations is the <coughs> formula for the deformation quantization of a general Poisson manifold. And that's the story which I actually wanted to... Um, this is Kansevich. Which it was done by Kansevich, yes. So I wanted to, to say a few words about... Uh, so in the, it's, so this is kind of the question about the foundations of <laughs> quantum mechanics again, uh, which is um, so traditionally. So there were kind of two approaches to quantum mechanics. So there was von Neumann who said that uh, we have states and observables are so the states form a Hilbert space and then observables are operators in, acting in this Hilbert space, the algebra of observables. And then uh, 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 came later the, uh, so this is why this is sometimes called Dirac von Neumann approach. And then there came Siegel von Neumann approach, which said that let's not start with states, let's start with observables. So observables is uh, what's known as C star algebra. And then states are special observables, which are projectors. Um, so in both approaches, you talk at the same time about states and, and, and algebra observables. But <coughs> mathematically, you can actually separate them. Because uh, from the mathematical point of view, the algebra of observables is an algebra. An algebra can have, and the space of states is a representation of this algebra. <coughs> but an algebra could have many representations. So in principle, you could imagine that you have different sources in physics for algebras and for algebras with representations. Now, if you think about quantum mechanics as a kind of the abstraction of the path integral, then you are stuck because here you, so the path integral over the uh, path with a given boundary condition give you states, and path integral with the, over the path with assertions give you states of which the op operator is active. But if you, you know, get take a high dimensional point of view, and that's where which, which is what you get from the string theory, you can imagine that your fundamental object 
is actually, uh, let's say, two-dimensional, like string wall chip. And then you can have operators which are just observable sleeping at the boundary. So they form naturally non-commutative algebra because on the boundary, so if these observables are only allowed to live on the boundary, you cannot move them around. There are some observables which can, which, which can live in the bulk. So they can be moved around and they, if they also belong to the same algebra, so if they can be moved to the boundary, they will form a commutative part of that algebra. So this is, <coughs> so what lives in the bulk is in general, should be thought as a commutative. And this is non-abelian or non-commutative. But uh, uh, things on the boundary, nevertheless, so here I'm making a certain jump into the realm of logical theories, where if you try to move things closer, they tend to pop <coughs> up. So if I try to move points one and two together, they, will not, they, don't, want, they don't like to collide. They will just form, the, the wall chip will form <coughs> a little bubble of this. Uh, and then, so, so you can, so then what the observable three will see will be is kind of a product result of a multiplication of one and two. Or you can move two and three together. And so, uh, in some theories, in some, in some two-dimensional uh, theories coupled to two-dimensional gravity, these two correlation functions are actually equal. Not in all, but in some. So that depends on the possibility of deforming this into a certain structure where you can do integration by parts. And so if, if this is the case, then the, uh, the algebra which you get from boundary observables will be associative. So this is associative. 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 So this is an example of, of uh, an algebraic structure which, is, which emerges from certain geomet geomet geometrical, ge geometrical combinatorics, actually. So uh, the, point is here, the point here is that you, from this you can get an algebra which a priori doesn't have to have any representation. Unless you can put an interest some boundary condition, if you, if you put a boundary condition on the other end of the street, uh, such that you know, the space of states which are allowed with the combined boundary condition, the one which produces the algebra, and the second one, if it forms a nice space, then you will get a representation of the algebra. So this is the representation. And this is what people who think, now this is where epistemolo epistemology and philosophy of, of consciousness comes into play, because this is where um, you know, philosophers, certain school of philosophy, uh, I apologize, uh, this is a French school of philosophy, uh, they, they think about questions like, of, um, so when we see something, when we have objects, and we call them something, so we assign a certain symbol, <coughs> so we signify what the object is, but there is, a, but, but there is something which is beyond that. And so there is a distinction between signifier and, sig and signified. And um, so this is to my, my best, my slightest approximation to it. So you can have algebra and you can have it representations. And in some cases, the algebra is equal to the totality of its representations. But I imagine that mathematicians came up with algebras which <coughs> don't have any faithful representation. So no matter, once you try to represent it, you lose some structure. Uh, and that very well may be reflected by, by, by a feature of some uh, topological single model, which does not allow boundary conditions other than, for example, the one which leads to the algebra itself. So the algebra always acts on itself, on the left or on the right, but you cannot make a small representation. OK. So, um, that's, that was a detour into the uh, modern view on this uh, algebraic uh, approaches. 
And but the, this detour actually illustrates some of the points which I made earlier because. So this is the way to to uh, produce the generation by. Um, so there is a there is a uh, there is a topological sigma model. Which studies maps of uh, Riemann surfaces to uh, to any so X could be any uh, real manifold. Uh, it oh, so okay, so it's actually dressed with various fermions. So it really studies the maps of the supersymmetric version of the Riemann surface to the supersymmetric version of the target space, and it makes sense for any any real real uh, real, real analytic target space, which is not uh, of the more familiar, it's not a more B type, but it sort of shares some of the features. And uh, I'm sorry, yes? I lost the part of the consciousness. OK. You lost it? Where, where was it? Ah. That this is a. This is a this is the mystery, Nazi. I think it's here. In the, it's in the, in the watching. <laughs> so this is the algebra. <coughs> the algebra. Where is the consciousness here? We should talk about this. The consciousness is an, it's an emergent. It's an emergent uh, phenomenon. It should emerge after I finish my lecture. So let me just say what I said. I said that algebras <coughs> and representations and spaces of states are in general separate, separate, separate quantities, separate things. So it, what looks like quantum mechanics actually can be a reduction of, of a two-dimensional theory on an interval. Mm -hmm. so, so quantum mechanics, it's a reduction of a So this is an example of reduction, which I mentioned earlier, where the the manifold on which you reduce has corners. So the interval has corners. The reduction is, is, uh, comes with, <coughs> with certain boundary conditions. And the clever choice of these boundary conditions can produce the algebra or the algebra with representation. Okay. Now, uh, you might object that, uh, well, so, um, so <coughs> this formula is, is, is very general. So it, it allows to, to obtain kind of a formal algebraic structure. The formula is a technical term, actually, uh, for any Poisson structure. So for if you start with any Poisson tensor, So from that, you can produce a product, kind of a, a new type of multiplication of functions. So g are functions on your original space x. So it starts as a usual product. Then you add the term and then and then apparently there is a unique way of writing a series such that the whole thing is associated. And this series is just a perturbation th series in the calculation of a three-point function. <coughs> 
the disk in this Sigma model, which I did not describe in detail. So F and G are just boundary observables, and this is where you read off the output. Nikita? Yes. Uh, is the statement that every quantum mechanical system can be can have a 2D tier topological field theory which will give it? Is there one example? What, what is the status? Uh, so if there is one clear, simple example, it would be nice. Yes. Uh, so, okay, uh, that's, that's where I was getting to. So, the, uh, so this, uh, so the, in this generality, typically you get an algebra, but it doesn't have any representations. Because in general, uh, there are no good, there's no boundary conditions which would carry a representation. But there, there are uh, subcases where the Poisson tensor is actually invertible, so it corresponds to a symplectic structure. And then, uh, the answer is yes, and that's a, a good way to connect to some of the Zohar lecture, actually. Uh, so, so we can consider the standard n equals four comma four sigma model. On, uh, I could actually start with the with the same top knot space, but it's better to start with the two center top knot space. So I will start with t star. So this is, it's a four-dimensional manifold, it's uh, called the gucci hansen gravitational instanton, uh, but it's a, so it's a, accidentally we know explicitly the metric of that space, and it has the uh, structure, so it's a vibration over R3, with the fiber being a circle, uh, which collapses uh, over two points. So there, there, there is a, a non-trivial S2 sitting inside this space. <coughs> um, it, it, it has a, it has a um, variety of complex structures, and in some of the complex structures, it can be described simply by the same equation you would describe a sphere, except that x, y, and z <coughs> are complex. So it's a complexification of the sphere. Uh, now, on that space, we can study the single model, and uh, amazingly, so you can actually study the so-called A model, which localizes so R, R itself is real? Could be complex. Also R could be complex. Yes. Yes. In fact, the metric, the metric on that space depends on three real parameters. And the sigma model on space depends on three real parameters and one periodic parameter. So the modular space of sigma model is R3 cross S1, although th there is an accidental accidental rotational symmetry in, in this R3, so actually uh, the metric itself depends only on the modulus of the vector. And this R is the projection, so this R can be given as, uh, let me call this part of zeta, so the new part of zeta, imaginary part of zeta. So, uh, so it turns out that so you, in this single model you consider d brains. So there is a brain which wraps all of the star of S2, so it means that we have normal boundary conditions. But uh, it also, s uh, so it, I'm sorry, it might be a bit uh, technical now, but so we, we uh, normally we can add to the sigma model action, which is, uh, which has the, bu bu uh, the uh, 
the bulk term, so bulk in this two dimensional sense. So the, as I said, so the metric depends on, on this vector R. field depends on the theta angle. So this is the bulk term, and we can also add certain boundary term plus terminals. Plus terminals. So there is a spe special gauge field which you turn on with the boundary. So, so it's a gauge field in uh, on this space, which becomes a boundary operator, which uh, admits a supersymmetric completion. And so, so, such that uh, the observables, which are now functions on that space, but not arbitrary functions, only holomorphic functions in one of the complex structures, for example, in this one. So these are holomorphic. Um, so the holomorphic functions are supersymmetric observables which can be inserted at the boundary, and they uh, operate a product expansion <coughs> will, uh, will have the structure with pi is related to the strength of the gauge field. So pi is like this dA inverse, essentially. Um, so, so this is where the algebra sits. But now uh, I'm allowed to, to, to have a second boundary. And here I can impose the usual Lagrangian boundary conditions. Lagrangian means that so this part of my boundary will end on the middle dimensional submanifold of that space. So it will not span all of the space. And I have many choices. And so you can have a so, so one choice would be to wrap it over, over, over on this two-dimensional sphere. And, but that is not always possible. That is possible when certain quantization is, is, is conditions obeyed by the by the flux of that of that gauge field. Uh, and so that case will produce the finite dimensional representations of SU2. So I forgot to say that this associative algebra, which you will get by, uh, by computing uh, this operator mm -hmm. expansion, is we actually know what this algebra is. It's the, you take the Lie algebra of SU2, and you turn it into associative algebra. So you just write all possible non-commutative products So one uh, module, but so you can impose one relation, and that's the Casimir. So you, you say that the value of the Casimir is fixed, and it's fixed to be equal to essentially zeta squared. So we know that. So this is the associative algebra. It makes perfect sense. Uh, it looks like from far apart, far away, it looks like the algebra of functions on the sphere. Because uh, I mean I don't care that this x and y are complex. We know that sometimes when this Casimir has a right value, this algebra admits a finite dimensional presentation. But if it doesn't, then it doesn't. But it might it admits, it admits lots of interesting infinite dimensional presentations, and they would correspond to other Lagrangian submanifolds, which could have this form, it could have this form. They could, uh, I mean, um, Lots of lots and lots of choices, and all of these choices would lead to representations of the Lie algebra of SL2, most of them infinite dimensional, which you can combine on the spin chains and study the uh, resulting uh, theory. So, uh, as Zohar said, it's uh, hard to control you know, the thermodynamic limit of a spin chain based on infinite dimensional. Uh, spin representations, uh, 
I would say that mathematicians don't know even don't even know how to control the finite dimensional you know, finite spin chains based on, on infinite representations. But here I put on my physics hat. Uh, using the combination of ideas which I which I sketched and talked about and, and maybe named and some of them I even didn't name, but maybe I'll talk about them tomorrow, you can actually get control of the over the over such spin chains. And that uses the uh, the topic which this uses a tool which I like very much, which uh, I would like to spend the last five minutes of my time talking about. And, um, so the um, the thing which I wanted to say about topological field theories, which was the lesson from I don't know, la last ten, 10 years of of research, uh, is the need to extend what mathematicians thought about quantum field theories and, and especially topological field theories in a way that. In allows to uh, the considerations of all defects of all possible co-dimensions and also singularities of, of various types. So uh, one type of defect, uh, both physical and topological, uh, Zohar mentioned, which so these were one defects. But uh, it turns out that it, it, it's quite uh, profitable to think about other types of defects. And, uh, so we can classify defects by the dimension or by the co-dimension. So, uh, so the, the line defect is the, it's a co-dimensional three defect in, in, in the three plus one dimensional theory, but it would be a co-dimensional two defect in the, in the two plus one dimensional theory, such as Chen-Simon's theory. So let's think about co-dimensional two defects. And we can again start on the lattice even though some of us hate to do this. But uh, so if you think about the largest formulation of gauge theory, <coughs> so I want to talk about co-dimension two defects in gauge theories. They are uh, especially suited for gauge theories, for ordinary gauge theories, because on the largest, so, we, so if we think about the So you have a lattice gauge field, which is the assignment of the group, group element to every edge of, of the lattice. And we have some gauge invariance. Uh, which rotates uh, these group elements by something which leads to the vertices. Um, so normally we write an action which penalizes, penalizes uh, non-trivial holonomies around small plaquettes, uh, no, plaquettes or small small uh, loops. So we have the action which uh, whose main purpose is to uh, make sure that on small distances the, the, the lattice holonomy is close to one. <coughs> Penalizes uh, Lattice curvature. So we want to we want the curvature to scale like the area. And so when the area goes to zero in the continuum limit, the, the exponential of that uh, curvature should go to one, and so the, this this action should be fine tuned to achieve that. But what if I choose a sequence of plaquettes? And, and just drop this, the uh, associated terms from the action. So that way, uh, or better yet, instead of instead of uh, writing the action which will uh, force this holonomy around the plaquette to be close to one, I can write an action which will force the holonomy around a chosen sequence of plaquettes to be close to a different conjugacy class. And so the the uh, dimension to defect is the instruction to perform the integral and then continuous limit path integral over the uh, gauge field configurations for which the product of lattice, uh, the ordinary product of, of, of 
like a cache fields has fixed uh, eigenvalues. This, this is for SUM. So in general, you want to fix the uh, congeneracy class. And so the continuous continuum limit, it means that you want the curvature of your gauge field, of dynamical gauge field, to approach a codimension 2 delta function, which uh, would be supported on the codimension 2 uh, submanifold, with the coefficient of which we, uh, so the coefficient takes values in linear algebra. We don't fix the precise value of the coefficient, so it, it's allowed to it's allowed to fluctuate along b, but we fix its conjugacy class. And so this so this belongs to a coset of the group gauge group by the stabilizer of this conjugacy class. So in general, it would be uh, maximal torus. So it's G mod T valued field. And so that object will depend on the shape of this uh, submanifold B. Uh, and uh, depending on the dimensionality of the of, of and the topology <coughs> of B, it may have additional additional couplings. For example, if B is two dimensional, then uh, there are different topological sectors in the space of maps of, yes. yes no. Oh, there's not a question. So, so there are different topological, uh, there are topological sectors uh, in the space of maps of B to, to the flag variety. And so we have, so these are uh, instant on sectors. And so we can sum over them with, with, with weights. So it will be associated theta <coughs> angles. And so this, this uh, surface uh, defect, so surface defect is what you get when B is two-dimensional. Uh, it's actually, it's not one defect. It's a whole family of defects, which are parameterized by the values of the state angles. In subspheric theories, typically, they get complexified. So you also. And they depend not only on the theta angles, but on some features of the uh, metric on, on the flag variety, which you can choose. And uh, it's interesting to study the dependence of the expectation values of, of these defects on, on those parameters. And um, okay, I'll try to say tomorrow a few words about how that study reveals an unexpected connection of uh, uh, gauge theories, which are continuous theories, to spin chains, which are lattice theories. And uh, that's, this is not the first example of, of uh, it's kind of a circle of, of, of ideas. So you start with some theory which may be microscopically defined as some lattice theory. You get to a continuous limit. You may get some massive theory, for example, massive continuous field theory. Sometimes it's an integral field theory. You can take uh, you can start the scattering of massive particles of that theory. You can arrange these trajectories of these particles into a lattice. They can intersect in, in various ways. And if you are lucky, then the scattering will be described in itself by a lattice, integrable lattice model, for which you can also go to the thermodynamic limit and get and, and then continue. So here we started with we start in these examples which I will talk about. You start with a class of theories which uh, we don't even know how to define a lattice because they, they are supersymmetric theories. There, instead of the scattering of massive particles, you study the uh, uh, surface defects, which which are arranged in dif so with di different arrangements of surface defects, and out comes the uh, wave function of a spin chain based on typically on infinite dimensional representations of the. SO2 or high dimensional algebra, and then the circle closes. Can go on? And thank you. So, <laughs> so, for the record, 